bio in the char. Uh, okay, who thought of biochar? Well, it wasn't us. It was, it was Amazonian Indians. The best we can piece together, it was Amazonian Indians. Well, how did we figure that out? Well, it took us a very long time to realize that, wait a minute, there were cities in the Amazon thousands of years ago. They were right in the jungle, and cities mean a lot of people, and a lot of people eat a lot of food. So how did these people get fed? Because they weren't just running around you know, picking fruits off trees. Jungle soils are no notoriously not a nutrient rich. They are actually just a platform. All the nutrients are in the living matter that sits on top of them. So they're not, they're not these fertile rich soils. So how did these people get fed year after year? There must have been something in the soil. So it was really anthropologists who started to tune into the fact that, wait a minute, we know that there's like these, all these roads, the, the ancient roads, and when we fly over them, we can see that all along the roads, these are these little nodes of very rich, verdant growth that looks different than the, the, so, the growth around it. So what's going on? We go on the ground and we look and we see that that soil is black and the, then the other soil is a, a bright orange. So what happened? Was it just some natural little pod of dark soil? But why is it always along the roads? Why is it always near, civil, uh, near cities? Well, what they started to do after they, they began to investigate is that, that soil was simply jungle soil with a whole lot of char in it. There were pottery chards, there were, there were um, all kinds of evidence of human activity, but there was a lot of charcoal, and it went very deep. So that's how they were able to support large populations, because as you know, slash and burn agriculture, which is being practiced all over jungles around the world, you're only going to be able to grow something there, or even, even grass for cattle, for McDonald's, um, will only be for, able to support any kind of growth for just three to five years at the most. And then you've got to move on, slash and burn something else. If you would, anyhow, it's very, it, and I just found out today how they did it. Ask me later. Okay, and ter these terra preta soils are still fertile. I got to go to the Amazon, um, this past fall and visit Terra Preta sites. And I'm talking to permaculture practitioners and farmers and they are on this Terra Preta land and they said, you bet, this Terra Preta land is worth five times what that jungle soil is worth and it is still highly fertile and still pr out producing by a factor of five jungle soils. 2,500 years later, what a gift to future generations for us to improve the soil so that they could continue to use it and, and and uh, enjoy its fertility and richness 2,500 years later. This is a, an actual live picture. Uh, this is a terra preta soil, and this is normal jungle soil. And they, they are that different. It's like, it's shocking. And the, that terra preta, um, uh, one of the uh, embarca, in, in, no, Mbapra, Mbapra, which is a, the, um, the Brazilian soil service, soil science group, um, dug four pits for us, eight feet deep. It was incredible, and they were perfect. But uh, that, that biochar was going down four feet or more in, in some of those pits. It was amazing. Um, and here's a, a, a photograph here of just a um, digging the soil, and this is the terra preta, and as you come down and, and get down here into 80 to 100 centimeters, you start to get into the regular jungle soil, but all, uh, from the top, you can see how it was very dark here and then slowly degrades to the, the normal jungle soil. But that's plenty of root zone for, for fertility. So again, what does it do? In summary, attracts and holds water and nutrients. It, it reduces uh, nitrous oxide off-gassing. It prevents that nitrogen and phosphorus, which loves to run around, to, uh, keeps it at home. It raises the pH and sequesters carbon, and it improves the soil texture. It's really good on clay soils because it makes it more friable. On plants, it, uh, again, the, the nutrients and water are more available, less fertilizers necessary. It's great microbe habitat. And, and as you probably know by now, that, that the mycelial world, that fungus and mushroom world, is phenomenal. And it is so important to the health of soil. They love to live in those little pores in the, in the biochar. And as a result, it improves plant growth. Sorry for the crappy picture, but uh, this, this was, um, all you need to look at is the height of this corn, and um, this is in Colombia. And at the the rate of 20 hectare, 20 tons per hectare of biochar, 
look at the difference in the in the growth here and it you know it, it's also in the vigor of the plant it, it's really significant and that's of course no biochar on the the far side there. And this, okay, you have to have a science slide to make sure that I'm, I'm you know, keeping, keeping accurate with the science. And, and what this is just looking at is, is it really recalcitrant? Will it really stay in the soils? And the studies have shown that, that um, you do have a very high recalcitrant um, characteristic of biochars that are made with slow pyrolysis, that's at the, sl at the um, cooler temperatures, of 100 to 900 years. That's the half-life. And, and it's been shown that, that a half-life of 80 is sufficient to say that that's good enough for sequestering carbon. Um, and the carbon sequestration values. I just had to throw this in because um, I really want to underscore that if we had a carbon market, biochar would be black gold, literally. And, and we were, um, at one point, we're seeing um, the European market go for about $35 a ton uh, for CO2. And if a ton of biochar is worth about three tons of CO2, then suddenly you're talking about about $100 a ton just for the carbon sequestration, not for all the other benefits that, that accrue.